Hello, and welcome to another episode of Heartstock Radio. I'm your host, Carol Murphy. We're recording here in our home studio today. It's a beautiful, hopefully soon to be spring day here in Montana. Our guest is Derek Muhammad. In just a moment, he's going to be with us and tell us all about Bossville Farm. Very excited to hear all about this, one of my favorite subjects, which is hemp. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. This land was made for you and me. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw the We're back with Heartstock Radio. I'm your host, Carol Murphy, and Daniel Hogan is in the studio. Today, our guest is Derek Muhammad, and he's with Bossville Farms. Hello, Derek, and thank you so much for being on Heartstock. Hi, Carol. Thank you for having us today. Indeedy, and I do appreciate your patience. We had kind of a failed attempt earlier this week, and my phone was not cooperating. So thank you so much for hanging in there. Can you oh, okay. can you give our listeners a little introduction? What is Bossville Farms? Sure thing. Uh, Bossville Farms is a hemp farm located in Hampton County, South Carolina. We're based out of Hampton County. We actually operate now in two counties in South Carolina. And uh, we've been in business now for the last three years farming hemp. My family is in the logging industry in South Carolina. So I come from a logging semi and farm uh, background. So we're uh, happy to uh, be here. And uh, we've now, uh, this is our third year here in uh, South Carolina being a licensed farmer. And that's interesting that you have a logging background. What got you into the hemp farming business? And was it hemp in general or farming? What was the attraction? Uh, is that, it actually was hemp. Uh, so I lived on the West Coast for about 10 years from 2003 to about 2013. And um Upon uh, moving back to the East Coast, where I'm from here in South Carolina, uh, I actually just moved to to Atlanta. But uh, my mom was running the logging company here and uh, it was struggling quite a bit. Uh, You know, my uncles were the primary uh, employees and they have been, you know, their whole lives. It's a family business. It's been in, in business now for nearly 70 years. So we were looking for a way to kind of uh, change industries or find a way to generate other uh, revenue. And so I I brought back to the family, hey, you know, uh, hemp is is a growing uh, industry. I think it's going to I think it's going to be a hit. It's really in our wheelhouse when it comes to, uh, you know, farming or land management and things of that nature. So I think it's something that we should explore. Unfortunately, I lost my mom in 2018 and I had moved back to Dallas at the time, and uh, when I came uh, back home again, when, when she passed away, you know, I, I brought that idea back to the family and said, "Hey, you know, I think this is going to be good," and uh, that's how we uh, we got into uh, hemp. You know, I, I think uh, hemp is definitely a replacement or a, a supplement for forestry and logging. And I think that, you know, some of the similar products can be made from hemp at a much faster rate. So that's how we got into the hemp industry. And tell us a little bit about, you know, your experiences there growing up. And I'm just kind of curious what took you to the West Coast and, of course, what brought you back? Sure thing. Uh, So growing up here in South Carolina, uh, I had two grandfathers. uh, Both were farmers. One went into traditional farming and the other went into logging. My paternal grandfather, uh, taught, he taught me a lot about traditional farming and, and the land and how to grow things. Uh, my maternal grandfather, though, was in, who owned the logging company, Gordon Logging Company here in South Carolina for, for almost 70 years now, he taught me more of business. And I really got a lot of my training from him because he would take me out and show me uh, the trees on his land. And he would tell me all the time, his son, everything comes from the ground. 
and he would point at his truck. He said, that truck over there, as beautiful as it is, it comes from the earth. And he would also tell me uh, that the biggest lie ever told is money don't grow on trees. <laughs> and I, I found that amused, right? Everybody gets a kick out <laughs> of that. That's a good right? one. But, <laughs> but really, when you think about it, what he was telling me is that he said that when I cut these trees down, I drag them across the scale, they pay me money. I got I go buy more land. And and he would always tell me, don't sell the land because everything comes from the land. Clothes, food, shelter. And you know, hemp offers all of those things to us, clothing, uh, shelter and food, and many, many, many other uses that, you know, uh, uh, a lot of us haven't even fathomed yet. And so it, I, I went out to the West Coast, I was in the music industry for a few years, uh, managing artists and producing artists, because I played the drums in high school. I was also a, an athlete, but I played the drums. And so I, once I couldn't play football anymore, I hurt my, myself in college. I really kind of went back in, uh, I, I went dormant for a few years, but I found my love for music you know, later in life. And so I moved to the West Coast to pursue that dream of, um, you know, uh, being uh, a music producer and also was a small business owner at the same time, you know, but once, you know, my mom started aging and she wanted me to come come back this way, you know, I, I turned around and came back to uh, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. So um, it's interesting, quite a diverse background, which is You know, I keep saying this, but a lot of the folks that we talk to and our guests here, you know, entrepreneurs in general seem to have this in common. What did you learn in the music industry and having your own small business that really prepared you for the next step? Wow. You know, uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing I learned in the music, well, I can't say the biggest, but a number of things. Number one, networking and, and understanding how to communicate and talk with people uh, from different uh, backgrounds and, and, and different areas and levels in life. I also learned a lot about uh, social media and how to use it, which has proven to be a really, really great benefit for us because um, we're, we've been able to sustain ourselves through uh, creating project pro- products or whatever for for our company and continue and and, and um, generate revenue. So we so learning how to navigate in social media and and and, um, and networking with various people was huge for me. Uh, and then those skills I brought with me to farming. Let's talk about the land a little bit. Um, sure. you, you mentioned your grandfather reinvested in the land. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about why your land is, why you thought it was suitable for him? I mean, what was the process there? Did you have to test the soil or amend the soil? What, what was that like? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we did... Uh, uh, you know, I went through all of the phases. Uh, my, the first thing was really evaluating the, the business and seeing if it would be a good fit for uh, this part of the country. And, you know, if hemp would grow in the climate in South Carolina. So I did a lot of research and found out that hemp was very big in South Carolina in the early uh, uh, early days of America. Um, but because of certain circumstances throughout the the uh periods of time, uh, it, it kind of got pushed to the back. But once we, once I, I came home and I, uh, I took a uh, look at a few of our parcels, and we have, uh, my grandfather left for us 2,000 acres of land, or near about, so about 2,000 acres of land, uh, various parcels, some of it, some of it uh, farmland, some of it uh, timber, some, you know, rental houses and whatnot. But, we, you know, I evaluated what would be a good spot to start in. I, I started in a small, smaller parcel, about 15 acres, put a well in because I needed a water source, put some some other uh, amenities on the property, um, a high tunnel uh, for growing indoors and Whatnot. But I, I did soil tests on the property. We, we looked around. You know, we wanted it to be secure because, of course, um, when we started, 
you know, everybody thought hemp was uh, cannabis. Uh, Dangerous. And, and Right. You know, and, and so we, security was a big deal for us. So we found one of our parcels that, that was very good. It was off the road, but it was a, a, a good feel, not too big. And um, that first year we grew three acres and we did very well. And not only did we grow here in, in uh, Hampton County, we also in that same year, we uh, grew in uh, Dorchester County uh, for another uh, family up there in Jacksonboro, South Carolina. So the first year we jumped in with both feet and, uh, you know, we did pretty good. And you mentioned your grandparents, your grandfather and your mom. Were there other people who were big influences in your journey? You know, whether it be the point at which you started growing hemp or even before that? Uh, Well, you know, I I was just uh, looking through some pictures. I was at a Black History program on Saturday. My sister uh, is, is a maven in Hampton County, and she... Um, did a program, but my high school football coach, uh, Coach Thomas Dawkins, uh, he's about 72 or 73 years old now, but he really uh, was a huge um, help to me when it came to farming because I had never really farmed on this scale uh, ever, uh, except for trees. You know, we I understood logging, but farming on in this scale, I, I didn't know, but Coach Thomas Dawkins, he's been our ag um, teacher at, at my high school for 40 years now. And uh, he was so happy when I came home and said I wanted to go on farming. It was like a dream come true for him. And so he's been with me every step of the way, every year. You know, uh, he's he's lent me his skills and he's, uh, his, number one, share all of his farming and ag knowledge with me. And, uh, you know, when we had to build uh, projects for the farm, like, for instance, we had to build a um, an apparatus that fertilizes the farm. Uh, he and I went, got a diagram, put it together in the shop, brought it out to the field and, and made it work. Any equipment that I did not have access to, uh, he would he would make sure that we found someone who could get equipment for us. Um, he has those, you know, low country connections with people to get things done. And uh, he was very instrumental in helping us to get the field prep, helping to get equipment to plant, harvest and um, transport products and equipment at many times. So he definitely was, was huge, a huge help for us. You used a term there. I'm curious. You said low country. Is that yes? Is is that a Carolina thing what what does that mean oh yeah 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 so <laughs> the low country of south carolina is um the, it's kind of like a line it's drawn near the middle of the state and everything from i would say orangeburg south carolina through charleston south of there is all low country is what we call it the low country got it yeah it's kind of like the, the high line in montana it's a it's a it refers to as a specific part of the state. That's that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we're going to take our midway point break here in just a moment. We will be back with Derek Muhammad and talk more about hemp. Welcome back to Heartstock Radio. We're speaking with Derek Muhammad, and he happens to be a hemp farmer. Now, this is um, traditionally, sounds like, something that was pretty common back in the day. And then hemp was made illegal. And now there's a resurgence. So at what point was it legal to start growing hemp again 
in South Carolina? Um, well, you know, the 2014 Farm Bill actually made it legal to grow hemp again. Uh, it took a few years for the USDA to put some programs together and then to push that down to the individual states. So most states or a few states have their own hemp uh, farming program uh, outside of what the USDA mandates through the Farm Bill. But uh, South Carolina has this, for instance, has its own hemp farming program. North Carolina uh, will, they, when you apply for a license in North Carolina, you apply to USDA. But here in South Carolina, you actually apply to the South Carolina Department of Agriculture. So once it was made legal and, pro and everybody figured out how their state programs will be ran, uh, then they open up uh, the applications in 2018 here uh, only to 20 farmers that first year, I think it was. Uh, and then uh, we finally got into the game in 2019 uh, for in a preliminary uh, sense. And then 2020, we were uh, full, full bore in the field. Mm -hmm. yeah. And originally, your business plan, can you talk a little bit about who you were going to be supplying hemp with? I mean, what were some of the products? Did that and did that change over time? Yes, absolutely. So, and uh, hemp kind of went up for. So, we started growing hemp for CBD in the beginning. We uh, soon learned that you know the green brush uh, had uh, gone south. The bottom fell out of the market. Ah, okay. In other words, yeah. So, so we just kind of we were you know most of the farmers were kind of left in a lurch. We had lots of biomass. Or and but we never we didn't know what to do with it. And biomass is just uh, the raw plant cut. So you, let's just say you cut the plant down and you have it hanging or you're drying it of some sort. Uh, so what 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 we had to do really was pivot on a dime at that point because our goal was to grow, sell it to a processor uh, and get the the money, or sell it to the processor to get the oil to sell the oil or the crude to a, a company that would take it and use it in their, in its products. Well, um, that just did not pan out well. And so in 2020, 2020, late 2020, 20, early 2021, we had to come up with a new plan. And so what we started to do was actually develop our own uh, products through uh, a processor that we that we were able to network with in Merrill's Inlet, South Carolina, and so you, you know we just like any other industry, if when something goes wrong, you have to figure out you know a way to stay afloat, and so that's how we've been able to stay afloat by creating our own line and and uh, staying afloat that way, our own brand. And so you know, Bossville Farms is more than just you know, farming now, we, we're we we're in many of uh, uh, different industries. And when I say that, I don't mean industries such as outside of farming necessarily. Uh, we have transitioned to a industrial um, genetic of the hemp plant, which grows very, very tall, very, very quickly. And is used for clothing and textiles and business supplies and building supplies, uh, so plastics. Are you selling the parts. seeds? Is that what you're doing? No, no, we actually grow the plant. And so what we're doing now is really stockpiling uh, uh, biomass or, or stalks of the plant um, for processing at some point. Um, we have looked into now moving from just growing uh, hemp into processing it at some point here in the next year or so in the southeast. Um, there are several hemp processing plants around the country for, for and this is for hemp that's used in textiles or building materials or plastics, things of that nature. Uh, not necessarily hemp that's used for CBD, which which is the most popular in a sense whenever you say hemp, that's what most people think of. Uh, so, so we we had to branch off into in, into that area of textile hemp as well as keep our our uh, medicinal and our uh, wellness lines going uh, 
uh, to, you know, keep the company afloat. So this is an entirely different species of hemp, is it, that you use for textiles versus CBD, or is it the same? It's a different genetic. I, you know, the plant looks the same uh, up to a certain point, but uh, this this one grows uh, mostly very, very tall with very huge fan leaves and and just one flower at the very top of it. Uh, unlike its uh, cousin, I call it the cousin, mm-hmm. the smaller uh, plant that's bred for uh, CBD where it has flowers on, on most of its uh, arms. So, uh, yeah, it's a little bit different. It produces seed, so, you know, you can make oil, you can make hemp milk with it. It also produces uh, fan leaves that people buy to make cigars from. Uh, and then the stock is used for uh, a huge, a huge number of, of um, products. The outer layer, the bass fibers are used for clothing and ropes and uh, other textiles. The woody core part is used for hempcrete and paper and um, other building materials. And the dust is used to make plastics. Mm. Yes. Wow. And, and that's always the beautiful thing is so many uses for the the plant. It's just yes. it's amazing. And, you know, my particular fascination is with textiles because it's biodegradable and yes. it takes less water. Can you talk a little bit about the cultivation of the plant? And you mentioned a well. So you're not dry land farming. You're you're irrigating it. The, we dry land, in, in a sense, the the plant that we grow for textiles. Ah. The plant that we grow for CBD, it, it, it's a much different process. Uh, so growing one plant uh, takes very little uh, manpower. And I say very little. It's just, you know, you kind of sow it like you do corn, in a sense. And uh, once you harvest it, that's where, that's where the manpower is needed. But... Planting is not so so much uh, as it is with the CBD version of the plant, where you actually have to have physical uh, labor to plant them and also to harvest them. Mm. And it sounds like it's a thirstier plant, so you have to irrigate it. Is that right? No. Well, yeah. So it's more fertilizing the uh, CBD version of the plant. Mm. The the other plant, if you fer- if you fertilize in the beginning, we and we use only natural fertilizers. We're a completely organic operation. We only use natural natural fertilizers for uh, both the CBD and the textile version of the plant. Once you plant it, though, we we depend on rain to take care of it from there. And most times, once you know, if it rains once or twice a month, that's all it really needs in, mm-hmm. uh, on the uh, outside for a grow. Which is so much more sustainable than cotton. Which, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I'm wondering, how did you achieve your funding? Are you solely self-funded or did you have investors? No, we're solely self-funded. So far, we've been self-funded. We have uh, recently, we're looking for funding to help with the processing plant to build that piece of the supply chain. Uh, But so far, as far as the farm goes, we've been self-funded. What we uh, have been able to do is really um, grow through networking, being a part of organizations and uh, you know, being innovative in our space. Uh, And when I say that, I I don't mean innovative in the sense of creating really anything new, but doing what most farmers definitely uh, don't do, you know, as far as uh, creating uh, creating products that you can uh, use to sustain your business, you know. So uh, most times it's just commodity. And and hemp is much more than just a commodity. And, you know, I, I hear that a lot in the space you know, people want to limit it to just being another commodity in this way. It's much more than that. And I think once we get the supply chain in place to start uh, seeing uh, this plant being processed for on, on the textile version, uh, I think, you know, people are going to be amazed at, at the, the many uses and how wonderful this plant is. Indeed. And I'm also wondering, I thought I saw 
probably on your website some research projects. We probably have about three minutes left. So I'm hoping you can talk about that. Are you doing, are you partnering with, I don't know, seed company or university? What kind of research are you doing? Uh, we did do research with Clemson University uh, almost two years ago now uh, for the textile versions. That's really where we got a lot of our uh, information from doing the project and growing it for Clemson. Uh, we are looking for a seed company or someone that wants to invest in some seed. Seed is very expensive for us. And we like to grow nearly uh, three or 400 acres this year. We have farmers that are waiting and what, I, what I've been doing is seeking funding to get seeds for the local farmers here to help them grow the plant on their farms and teach them how to grow it so that we are ready to supply the processing plant when that processing plant is up and running. Yeah, and you can, you know, visit us, bossfieldfarms.com is our website, and we'd love to hear from you. And I'm wondering, isn't there like a, a textile and manufacturing network of folks in the Carolinas kind of sprouting up. That would be awesome if you could supply hemp textiles to those who are actually, you know, going to make it into beautiful products. Absolutely. We're looking for to do that. You know, that's the process of plant. The idea is to supply all of those industries. You know, we have a lot of car companies coming here, uh, Volvo, BMW, Mercedes. They all use hemp in their uh, bioplastics for their plants. Uh, the BMW is already 16% hemp, and Volvo is right now just completed testing and starting to use hemp in its products as well. So we definitely are looking to supply those industries and grow hemp into a climate and a world-saving plant. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your website. How else might folks find you? Uh, I am on all social media at Bossville Farms. You can find me on LinkedIn as we met Carol Derek Muhammad on LinkedIn, um, Bossville Farms on LinkedIn, Bossville Farms on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Pretty much that. If you Google Bossville Farms, we're we're definitely going to pop up here in South Carolina. <laughs> well, this this makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. We really, I appreciate you too. Thank you very much for having us on. Uh, you know, Bossville is a family run business. Um, my wife and I and my children actually run the company. So um, we're very appreciative of, you know, you reaching out to us and taking the time to talk with us. Mm, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, really appreciate it. We'll uh, see everybody next week again or. You'll hear us for sure. Thanks for listening. This is Heartstock. Peace. Heartstock Radio is a production of KBMF 102.5 Butte America Radio. Hear our programs every Friday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time via live stream at butteamericaradio.org. Put on the other side.